people need reasons why, and it's the why that really motivates people. I believe that the real reason anyone follows anyone else is because they trust them. To be a real leader, you have to be able to get people to follow you because they want to and they trust you, and that's commitment. Everybody knows how good they become, but none of us know how good we can be. And I like to address that area of potential, raising people's awareness and their aspirations. Tomorrow morning, there'll be 2,000 people in those chairs, and the culmination of months of planning will pay off as this organization discusses what's really important, and hopefully I challenge them with some new thinking and some ideas that'll help them sell more, lead better, and live larger. Everybody's a world changer. The only question is, what kind of change are they making? Fame is based on what you get, but greatness is based on what you yeah. choose every day to make a positive difference in the lives of the people around you. Few of us in this room are ever gonna be famous, but every one of us in this room can be great. You don't accidentally excel, you excel intentionally. When people have a choice, they would prefer to do business with people who are nice as well as competent. Good morning, Team Shine. You're either positive or negative, pro or con, good or bad, neutrality is a myth, it is a choice. Finding one person a day to do something extraordinary you for always make a difference. The only question at the end of the day is, what kind of difference did you make? The internationally best-selling author on leadership and customer service himself, uh, past president of the National Speakers Association, the youngest, to be inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame. He's authored eight books, Done over two dozen audio and video training sessions. He has 2,400 clients around the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Sanborn. Today I'm going to tell you a story. You're going to think on the surface a story doesn't have anything to do with what you do in practice analysis or the products and services you provide, but I absolutely believe the story I'm about to share is the past, present, and future of Henry Schein. 1988, I was single and living alone. I bought my first house. I bought a house in an area of Denver called Washington Park. An old 1928 bungalow, it was about 950 square feet. I lived in my new old home all of about two days when there was a knock on the front door. I opened the front door, and standing there was a relatively short fellow. He was about 5'3", weighs about 115 pounds, wearing a blue-gray uniform, carrying a bag, an Errol Flynn mustache, and he says, Good morning, Mr. Sanborn. My name is Fred. I am your postman. I just stopped by to say welcome to the neighborhood, introduce myself, and find out a little bit about you and what you do for a living. I've been receiving mail all of my adult life. I can't ever recall getting a personal introduction to the postal carrier, but I thought it was a nice touch. I said, Fred, thanks for stopping by. I said, I am a professional speaker. I do not have a real job. <laughs> Fred said, well, that's important for me to know. If you're a speaker, you must travel a lot. Now, at the time, I was doing about 220 days a year on the road. And I told him that. And Fred said, great, if you'll just give me your calendar so that I know when you're in town. I'll hold your mail for you, I'll bundle it, I'll only deliver it on the days that you're here to receive it. Now, I'd never had a choice of a la carte mail service before either. I said, Fred, you know, that, that's probably not necessary. I said, I've got, a, I've got a pretty big box right here on the side of the house. Why don't you just leave the mail in the box? I'll pick it up when I come back into town. Fred said, well, Mr. Sanborn, let me point out, you know, burglars watch for mail in the box. That's how they know you're gone. He said, here's what I'd recommend instead. He said, I'll be glad to put mail in your box as long as the lid closes. That way nobody will know that you're gone. Any mail that doesn't fit in your box, I'll put in between the screen door and the front door. Nobody can see it there. And if that area becomes too full of mail, I'll hold the rest of your mail for you until you come back into town. Now, Fred is more worried about my mail than I am. But after all, he is the postal professional. Listen and consider a professional is someone who is more concerned about the solutions to your problems than you are. A professional educator is more concerned about your kids learning than you are. A, a, a professional health care provider more worried about your health than you are. A professional here at Henry Schein more worried about the success of the dentist and his or her practice than they are. And the reason that's my definition of a professional is it creates what I call a no-brainer client. 
they never think about going somewhere else. They don't think about Patterson because they know you are more worried about their success than they are when it comes to their dental practice so they can provide dental care. So I agree with Fred. Loved him. I thought he was awesome, really funny. I think he really resonated with the crowd. Mark, he kept me awake, he kept me laughing, and kept me engaged, and I appreciate that. You know, in my work with audiences, I often kid around and I say that politics comes from two root words, poly meaning many and ticks meaning bloodsuckers. I mean, he's selling jokes, really personable. Brings it down to a level where we can all understand whether it's personal life or professional life, all of it makes sense and you can apply it everywhere. One of the things I try to do is create congruence between what I say on the platform, how I live my life, and importantly, how I run my business. Awareness comes through real flesh and bone principles. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And that's the beginning point to helping people understand that we're all ordinary, but that nobody can prevent you from choosing to be extraordinary. I spend most of my waking hours thinking about possibility because potential is about possibility. All of us know how good we become, none of us know how good we could be. And what I'd like you to do right now, since almost everyone in the room either has ridden or currently does ride a bicycle, I would like you to just turn to the person next to you and share the answer to this question. How fast do you think it's possible to ride a bicycle? Just take 20 seconds, turn to the person next to you, and miles per hour, how fast do you think it is possible to ride a bicycle? All right, all right, let me get your attention back. Now, now here's, I want you to keep in mind the number, the miles per hour that you chose and the miles per hour that your, your colleague chose. Because I'm not clairvoyant. I wish I was one of those people that could pick someone at random and say, this is the number you chose. I don't know what number you chose, but I know how you chose the number. You thought backwards. See, whenever somebody says what's possible, you think about what's probable. Whenever somebody says what's possible for next year's sales, you think about last year's sales. I mean, the dental profession grew at an annual compound rate of 4% a year until 2008. In 2008, it started to decline. It did not stabilize until 2011. And the most recent research is that this, this profession of dentistry will be flat for the next 10 years. Does that not represent a challenge to your customers and clients? That growth for them is gonna be harder than ever before. And if it's hard for them to grow, you're gonna to have to help be that driver of growth. But even having said that, whenever you say to somebody what's possible, they think about what's probable. So if you've ridden a bicycle to a speed of 20 miles an hour, you might have doubled it and thought 40 miles an hour. And if you watch the Tour de France on TV, you see them coming down out of the mountains on skinny tired bicycles, they're doing 60, sometimes approaching 70 miles an hour. But you say, hey Mark, that's gravity. That's really not under their own power. So what's possible, 1985. Three-time retired U.S. Olympic athlete John Howard was at the Bonneville Salt Flats. It was July 20th, 1985, and John was there to answer the question, how fast can a human being ride a bicycle? Now, he was not riding your dad's Schwinn. He was riding a specially built bike, one turn of the pedals, one revolution of the crankshaft, moved the bike about 110 feet. Severely geared bicycle. They monitored his heart rate and at peak, he was sustaining a heart rate of 195 beats per minute. For many of us in the room, that would induce massive coronary. And he set a land speed record and I want you to check your number against John's because John rode a bike to a speed of 152.2 miles per hour. Anybody guess 152? By the way, if you'd guessed 152, regrettably you'd be wrong because in 1996, a European achieved a speed of 166 miles an hour. We all know what is probable. None of us know what is possible. We don't know physiologically. We don't know psychologically. We don't know organizationally. And I don't care how big your imagination is. You can't begin to estimate the true potential, the true possibility that you have here at Henry Schein Dental. He hit really close to home on Henry Schein's value system. Well, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I think it's a story that probably hit home um, with a lot of people. You can probably customize it to any organization uh, and have as just a big impact as it did for us. Because you see, I want to be integral. I study the company. I ask the right questions. But I think the real value add for me is that I, I make it easy for people to apply what I'm talking about. 
all of his Red Factor book was very, again, applicable to Team Shine, what we do, how we should all run our business every day. I use the term actionable narrative. What that means is, is I tell stories that people can act on. An actionable speech gives people something they can do when they get back from the meeting or when they go back to work on Monday morning. And that's very important to my clients, so it's very important to me as a speaker to provide that tailoring. My call to action is this, love better. Love. See, my, uh, my editor, Roger Scholl, made me take the word love out nine times. When I wrote The Fred Factor, I used the word love nine times. Roger said, take it out. We're going to use generosity of spirit. If you're ever reading The Fred Factor and you come to the phrase generosity of spirit, cross it out and write in love. Because <laughs> that's the way I wrote the book. I said, all right, Roger, why do I have to take out the word love? And he said, and I quote, because love freaks out business people. You talk about love in a business book, they won't buy it. Love freaks out business people. Guess what? Roger was only half right. Love freaks everybody out. See, we think it's emotion or sentiment or sensuality or relationship, but I want to define love today. And I think Dave and Tim and Jimmy and Stanley will agree. Love is a commitment to treat people with dignity and respect, regardless of how you feel about them. It's a choice. I love my wife. And she loves me, but there are days I guarantee you she does not want to be married to me. And I probably don't feel like being married to her, but we stood up in front of God and a bunch of our friends and we made a commitment to love. And we got past the idea that it was going to be fun and frolic all the time. And the commitment has sustained and deepened the emotion. I want you to love better. They asked Lindsay Owen Jones when he was the CEO of L'Oreal, arguably the most successful cosmetics company in history. They said, Forbes magazine, they said, what is the secret of L'Oreal's success? And it was the best answer I've ever heard a CEO give. He said, if there was a reason why we are successful at L'Oreal, it is because we love this business a little bit more than our competition. You are successful at Henry Schein because you love this business a little bit and probably a lot more than the competition. I hope you love who you do it with. I hope you love the people on your team, the people sitting next to you, the people that support you at corporate, the events team, because what I do up here for an hour is nothing compared to the kind of work the events team has put into an event like this. I hope you love them, and here's the good news, you don't have to like them, because like's an emotion, but you gotta love them. You say, Mark, how can I love people who are so diametrically different, who don't always support me, who sometimes argue with me? Here's how you do it. You love them because you share this commitment. You are as committed to the success of Henry Schein and his clients as they are and vice versa. Because if you share that commitment, you can put up with a lot of differences among people on your team. I hope you love who you do it with. And finally, I hope you love who you do it for. I think every group I talk to is leverageable, but I can't think of a group much more leverageable than you. When it comes to oral health, when it comes to healthcare, you are impacting the difference makers that have hundreds, thousands, millions of patients, and you're giving them a better way to run their practice so they can make a bigger, deeper, better difference in the lives of their customers. And they could go elsewhere. They can go a lot of different places and they vote by giving their money to you. See, because here's my final thought. If you love what you do, and you love who you do it with, and you love who you do it for, I guarantee you, you will win the game and you will keep winning the game. Thank you, and God's I think people need reasons why, and it's the why that really motivates people. Why do I do what I do? There's a lot of reasons. I love to communicate. The most fun I have is being in front of an audience, engaging and interacting. The love factor, love what you do, be invested in what you do, and reinvent yourself every day and take good care of your customers is so important and it shows. I believe that ideas are the, the fuel of leadership. It was incredible. It was phenomenal. It kept everybody involved. He was entertaining, he made you laugh, made you think the whole time. Ideas well applied can change a person's life, can change an organization or a community for that reason. It all matters and you can make the difference. I thought it was really, really inspiring. We got us all pumped to go out there and, and do what we got into this company to do. His message about Fred and building a team of Freds, you know, this is our national sales, we have 1,200 salespeople. Our goal is to build a team of 1,200 Freds. 
ultimately I want to educate. You know, I want to give people ideas that'll help them do business better and live better lives. So what I bring to the party, education, entertainment, and engagement.